It happened at about 8.50 in the morning, so powerful and frightening that no one had ever witnessed anything like it before. Our houses were destroyed and most of our dear relatives died. Some were buried under their own roofs while some were crushed by the crumbling mountains. We were waiting for death to come and catch us. We were certain we would not survive. The earthquake was so intense. We saw mountains crumbling everywhere like snowflakes and we could hear shrieks and screams around us. Everyone was digging out dead bodies and burying them. Nobody could be asked for help. Everyone was involved with their own personal calamity. On the third day, we came to Rawalpindi and got my little Sultan admitted to a hospital where he was operated upon. So many people were arriving at that hospital. We have been extremely well looked after by all the nurses and doctors, but we are especially thankful to our Pakistani brothers and sisters who have helped us and to all of those who have sent assistance and aid from outside. May God bless all of them and us. Your most recent book is a collection of first-hand accounts mm -hmm. from the 2005 Pakistani earthquake. What did you experience in the quake zone? You know, as a Pakistani, um, the 2005 earthquake was um, completely devastating. Uh, it was a generation of young Pakistanis that was wiped out. I mean, 80,000 people lost their lives um, in the earthquake. And we saw this amazing outpouring of grief in Pakistan. We saw a lot of Pakistanis come together to collect aid and, and to go up to the affected areas and help. But the one thing we never saw was we never saw the survivors. We never saw them speak for themselves. Um, their stories were always told for them by newscasters, by journalists. And so I traveled up to the area a month after the earthquake in November of 2005. And I really wasn't sure what I was supposed to do up there. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a South Asian favorite. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an engineer. So what could I do? And, it, and I went up with medical aids for, for, for women and children. And it was at a children's hospital um, that I found these young children, young boys and girls, who were so desperate to talk. Um, they wanted to tell you where they were when the earthquake hit, and they wanted to tell you what happened to their school, and they wanted to tell you what they felt like now. And I wanted to be a part somehow of, of helping them do that, because I had never heard it before. Um, we just hadn't heard them themselves. They had always been described passively as victims, but they were very much survivors. So the point of the book, I think, was to archive what had happened and to document the devastation of the earthquake, to keep it in people's minds, even now, three years later. Fatima, you believe that your father had wanted you to become a writer. He uh, sent the manuscript of uh, your first poetry collection, Whispers of the Desert, to a publisher when you were 14 years old. Yes. What an amazing thing to do. I mean, what, what drives you to keep writing? Um, I love it. I have, since I was a child, uh, I always enjoyed writing. I interview my parents. Um, I used to write short stories. And it was always my father who encouraged me. Um, you know, he was a very progressive man, and, and he always insisted that, um, that I work, that I do what I love doing. And he would, he would read my work. He was my first reader, uh, if you can call it that. And... You know, he said to me when he started reading the poems, he said, you must publish these, these are wonderful. And I thought, are you kidding? You must be crazy. But, but he did, you know, he kept, he kept asking in on them, he kept checking in on my writing. And he was just, he was a wonderful support system. And so, you know, it was fitting that, that it, it was after he was killed that the, that the volume was published. And I dedicated it to his memory. You've certainly got plenty of admirers out there, not just for your work, but also for you as a young, pretty woman. <laughs> and uh, you have, uh, you have uh, sort of opened yourself up to receiving um, emails from fans. <laughs> God knows why. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the stranger ones that you've received? Goodness. Um, well, I get a lot of serious emails uh, asking for my phone number. <laughs> which, which is funny. Well, you've given out your email address. Do you ever give out your phone number? <laughs> well, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm the one in the wrong here. But, <laughs> but I do get a fair amount of, of emails um, from people who 
Well, it's funny, you know, I wrote, I was, well, telling you before we started rolling, about um, an incident that I wrote about in Lahore last year where two women um, fell in love and, and they got married. And they were harassed by their families and they went to the courts to seek protection. The courts turned on them and um, arrested them. And the media just followed these women incessantly and called them names and just did this awful coverage. And I wrote an article saying, what's the problem? They're a private couple, this is a private matter, and let's leave them alone and let's talk about something else. And I got a fair amount of hate mail afterwards. Um, that was interesting. Some, some very kindly wrote in to tell me that I obviously didn't understand the situation because I'm a woman, and that being so, I have a much smaller brain. Um, and then nice. proceeded to explain the situation to me. I wrote back to those. Fatima, it was great to meet you. Thank you very much indeed for sitting down with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of Talk Asia. Thank you for being with me, Anjali Rao. And my guest today, the author Fatima Bhutto, niece of the assassinated former Pakistani Prime Minister Benazir. I'll see you again on the next Talk Asia. Bye-bye.